who keeps your promises, Lord, and that you're a God that wants to bless us. And we just claim those blessings over our families and over our lives.
together, we can still be together spiritually and that you're still here in our midst, Lord. Just thank you so much for your presence. And we just pray that you would prepare our hearts for your word this morning, Lord. That you would change us and that you would renew us. Thank you so much for who you are. Hey guys, we're back. Um, we are rested, recharged, and ready to rock and roll. Uh, from Renee and I, we just want to say thank you so much for being a church that uh, not only believes in us as leaders, but also believes in uh, our leadership team uh, with uh, Pastor Pat and Ronnie and Tammy, along with our church council. Uh, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, 19 years of being in full-time vocational ministry. Uh, a wise counsel I once heard was that, hey, when you're tired, don't quit, rest. And that's what we exactly did. We were able to rest, we were able to recuperate, we were able to recalibrate and have some time for respite and spend time together as a family. Uh, thank you for just allowing and investing us to uh, have longevity for the future you know from the meal trains uh, it was such a treat and delight I know some of you stopped by and we're able to connect and you know our kids were looking forward to Ooh, what are we gonna get this Friday so thank you thank you from the bottom of our hearts and church I just want to say what a blessing it has been um, to be able to take some time off uh, to take time with the family to recalibrate recharge and um, believe it or not, um, I was actually bragging on you guys as we were resting. I would call my other pastor friends and say, oh my gosh, can you believe like this is what's happening? Like our church is doing this. They're bringing us meal train. Uh, they're, they've given us an extra month. And um, my friends would just, you know, my other friends who were in ministry would just be like, oh my gosh, that makes me want to cry. You know, the way your church is loving on you. And um, we just felt so loved and cared for um, by you in this season. So we just thank you again from the bottom of our heart. We know that sometimes it's not um, easy, uh, you know, just, you know, not being together all the time, but we, we thank you. And um, we look forward to what the Lord is going to do in our church in the future. God bless. It's the most wonderful time of the year. That's right, church. The holiday season is upon us and we've got a lot of special things coming up. So get your calendars out and mark it up. The first thing is our servant appreciation dinner. That is going to be on Thursday night, December 1st at Wyoli Tea Rooms. Um, it is an awesome time to get together as a church family and celebrate you and all that you do for this church. I know that um, you know, so many have sacrificed and given. And so if you've helped or volunteered or served in any way at any capacity at our church, we'd love to see you there on Thursday night. Up next, you guys, we have a lot of amazing um, ministries to donate to. I know the holidays can be a, a time of year where we feel like a little more generous or we feel like, how can we help? Um, there's so much need. And so we have two amazing Christmas outreaches that we are doing. The first one is Operation Christmas Child. And I know that the shoe boxes have gone out and you guys are shopping and getting them all filled up. I just want to remind you that those are due back at the church on November 20th so that we can send them to their uh, respective areas. I know that's such a blessing to the communities um, that receive them. The next thing is our Angel Tree um, Ministry. And you can come, actually, if you come in person to church, there will be a beautiful Christmas tree set up and there'll actually be names of children that you can purchase a gift, a very personalized gift. And you're doing that on behalf of their parent who happens to be incarcerated. It is a wonderful uh, ministry. It is a way to show these kids that you are not forgotten, that the Lord sees you. And so it's just one of those things it, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And at Christmas time, what a better, you know, what a, what a great opportunity to do that. 
So with that being said, um, we're going to prepare our hearts for our tithes and offerings. Um, you know, I just know that sometimes in the Lord's kingdom, a lot of times actually, most of the time, um, you know, things don't really make sense or they don't really add up. Like we think if we want to, um, you know, save money and get keep our money and, and so we've got to reserve and we've got to hold um, and, and save. Um, but in the Lord's kingdom, the Lord is so generous and he freely gives and he encourages us to freely give. And, um, and it, it, it's so crazy. And this is what I'm talking about. Like, it doesn't make sense. You know, like me and my husband, we're faithful. We have been faithful to tithe. And as we do that, the Lord continues. When I think that we're short, when I think that we're not going to make ends meet, the Lord continues to provide. And our tendency and our human nature is to hold on. But the Lord says, hey, I'll take care of you. Just do what I'm telling you to do. And I, I just love that about the Lord. And so the Lord takes care of, of his people people. And so I just want to encourage you today in your faith as you give. It doesn't even matter the amount um, the Lord sees and the Lord will bless you. The Lord will continue to provide for you. And so thank you for continuing to give on a, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. Um, so would you pray with me as we prepare our hearts for the message? Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We, we thank you, Lord, that you are a good and generous God, that you, when it comes to your children, that you are not closed fist, fisted, but you are open-handed and that you freely give, that you generously give. And so Lord, this morning, um, as we are approaching a time of Thanksgiving season and holiday season, Lord, I pray that our hearts toward you and toward one another would be generous. And Lord, that as we are generous, that you would continue to pour out your blessings upon us so that we can be a blessing to others. Lord, I pray for the message. I pray for um, Pastor John as he talks today about abiding in you. And Lord, we declare right now that without you, Lord, there is no life. Lord, without you, we are disconnected. And Lord, we need, we need you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to refresh us and fill us, Lord, that, that we would abide in you. We love you, Lord. We welcome you into this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, good morning, guys. Uh, there is no place like home. I'm so glad and I'm so blessed to be able to uh, be back here uh, with you guys at uh, New Hope Community Church and uh, you know it's been a four month sabbatical it were originally it was intended to be three months but the council got together and and recommended to take another month and so um, it's so good to be back home uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been on vacation and you go for a while and when you come back from vacation right you need a vacation from your vacation and you're just like, oh man, I can't wait to be back home. Even when you go out, you know, maybe you go to the North Shore or you spend the day at the beach and you're all sandy and it's hot. It's been a long day. You've been driving all day. And what uh, are you excited to go back to, to go back home? And uh, being here with you guys, it's home and it feels good. You know, I've never watched so much football in my whole life. In the past 43 years, I've never watched football as I have in the last four or three months combined. Um, but, you know, I'm so excited to be back home. And since I'm back, uh, it's time for some uh, Dallas Cowboys slander. It's week nine of NFL, and I'm just hating because the Rams are stinking it up right now, but it's all good. So uh, I saw this meme uh, for all you Dallas Cowboys fans out there, and uh, here's a shape. It's a Pentagon. Yeah, five, penta meaning five. Here's the next shape, a hexagon, uh, six, right? Uh, here's for those of you MMA fans, UFC fans, here's an octagon, eight sides. And for the Dallas Cowboys, here's the Dallas Star, season gone, all right? So uh, forward your hate mail to Patrick at New Hope Community and Pastor Pat will make sure to send that along his way. But anyways, um, Today we're going to start a three-week series on John 15 verses 1 through 8 called Abide. 
abide. And we'll just go straight into the text. And we'll read from the ESV version. Verse 1, John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Here it is. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Uh, Father, um, we know, Lord God, that the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord, it endures forever. Even as we have read this morning, that we are cleansed, we are clean already because of the word that I have spoken to you, declared Jesus. So Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the enduring power of the word of God. We thank you for the cleansing uh, power of your words, Jesus. And so right now, Lord Jesus, we ask that you uh, forgive us anything you have said, done, or thought that has grieved your spirit. We ask, Lord, that, we, that you forgive us and we repent and turn away and we turn to you. Lord, I pray right now that our hearts would be fertile ground for your word to take root into our soul, transform us from the inside out. That your word, O oh Lord God, that, would, that we would be connected to the vine and that we would bear fruit in you, everlasting fruit, fruit that endures and lasts. Lord, we pray that you would do this for the sake of your glory and your great name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, in John chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus starts off with the statement of, I am the true vine. And my Father, God the Father, He is the vine dresser or He is the gardener. All right. And if you're familiar with the Gospel of John at all, uh, John, uh, in John chapter 15, in the whole Gospel of John, there are seven I am statements. In other words, there are seven instances where Jesus proclaims his, that He is God. He proclaims His Messiah, that He is the Messiah by making these I am statements. And there are seven of them. All right. In John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. John chapter 10, verse 7, I am the door. John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 15, I am the true vine. John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. And I am the true vine here, the seven I am statements. I believe this is like the culmination of Jesus' I am statements. He declares who he is because he is the light of the world, because he is the bread of life, because he is the resurrection of the life, because he is the good shepherd, because he is the door, because he is the true vine. We are to then abide or stay close to Jesus. And this I am the vine and abiding in him. This is the central part of the farewell discourse, meaning that Jesus is saying goodbye to his followers. And in John chapter 16, he talks about that the Holy Spirit is coming. And in John chapter 17, Jesus has his high priestly prayer 
which means that because Jesus, he functions as the high priest, he prays for you and he prays for me. So this I am the vine, this is central to our understanding of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. And this culmination is abide in Jesus. There's actually two more I am statements in the Gospel of John, but they are not uh, metaphorical. They are declarations of, of Jesus. And for example, in John chapter 8, Jesus says, hey, before Abraham was, I am. Okay. Or in John chapter 18, in the Garden of Gethsemane, they said, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am. But all that to say is that the thrust of this passage and these next three weeks, three weeks is that we stick close to Jesus, that we have this abiding relationship, that it, it's not about following rules, it's not about adherence to the Ten Commandments, but really finding our home in God. And here's the main point that I want us to uh, take away from this morning. It is this, the goal of the Christian life is to live a lifelong, intimate relationship. Underline that, write that in, text that into your phone, type that up in your iPad, right? The goal of the Christian life is to live a lifelong, intimate relationship with Jesus, abiding in Jesus. Now this word uh, abide, uh, this Greek word meno, um, it's used over 10 times here in, in John chapter 15 and it's occurred more than 40 times in the whole New Testament over 24 times Jesus uses it or John uses it in the Johannine Gospels meaning in the Gospel of John over 24 times this word abide occurs and this word abide means to to be close to have an intimate relationship it means to make your home with Jesus and, and you might be thinking, wait, 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 John, the goal of the Christian life is to have this abiding relationship with Jesus, to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. I thought the goal of being a Christian is to go to heaven. The goal of the Christian life here on earth, you guys, is to abide, it's to remain, it's to find your home in Jesus. You see, when you and I, when we received Jesus, when we repented of our sins, when we believed the gospel, when we put our trust in the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus, you and I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have become His disciples and our soul is secured in heaven. We have been guaranteed eternal life. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, right? We all know Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who call according to His purpose. But why do all things work together for good to those who love God? Because of 8, 29. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He also predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Do you guys see here that Jesus is in the middle? He's in the beginning, He's in the middle, He's in the end. He foreknew you, meaning God had the foreknowledge before you were even born, before the earth was even formed, before there were the mountains, before, the, before Mauna Kea was even formed, God had the foreknowledge. He would imagine that you would, you would be born before you were even in the womb. God foreknew you. And because based on that foreknowledge, because God is outside of time, He predestined you. He didn't predestine you for wrath, but He knew, and He put the times and the situations and the circumstances, put you in the family that you lived in, 
gave you the neighbors and co-workers and the friends that you would have so that you would hear the gospel, you would believe in Jesus, and He's predestined you to be conformed to His Son. And not only did He predestine you, but what, what else did He say? He also called you. He called you unto Himself. When you said the sinner's prayer, when you received Jesus, when you've repented of your sins, He calls you unto Himself. And when He called you, what else happened? He justified you. He declared you righteous. You are my son. You are my beloved son and daughter with whom I am well pleased, with whom my favor dwells. And because he justifies you and because God has declared you righteous, what else? He glorified you, meaning till the very end from foreknowledge to being glorified, God has heaven secured for you. And you don't have to worry about your, if you're sin, you don't have to worry about making mistakes because Jesus paid it all on the cross. Every step of the way, God paid the way through Jesus for you to go to heaven and heaven is not your goal here on earth. Heaven is to experience your goal here now is experience heaven on earth by having this relationship with Jesus, by having this intimacy, this abiding love with Jesus. And this is what it's all about. When you receive Jesus, you didn't sign up for fire insurance or you didn't have a get out of hell card. When you receive Jesus, your soul is secured, like what he told the thief on the cross, right? Today you will be with me in paradise. And so we come to this place then that God secures your salvation. God preserves. All right. It's called the, in theology, we call this the uh, perseverance of the saints. The reason why the saints persevere and endure is because God preserves us. He he foreknew us, He predestined us, He called us, He justified us, and He will glorify us. And because heaven is secured, our goal here on earth now is to draw near to Jesus. It's not heaven because it's to experience heaven here on earth through Jesus. See, the idea of abide didn't start with Jesus in the New Testament. It started with God abiding or dwelling with us first. Look at this idea of abiding in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 25 verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. We have this idea that God was this mean old grandpa or he, had this, he was like Zeus. He had this uh, thunderbolt ready to strike. But he says, no, no, no. I want to abide. I want to dwell with my people. Look at Leviticus 26, 11. I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you. Ezekiel 37, verse 27 to 28. My dwelling place. God wants to make his home with you in our hearts, in our lives, here on earth. He, he has made a way and he was the one who initiated making home with us. He tabernacled among us. I will be their God and they will be their people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Listen to me very carefully. God made his dwelling among us first. God takes the initial and decisive action of making his presence dwell among us and he abides in us first. We did not seek God first. He first sought us. We did not love God first. He first loved, loved us. We did not serve God first. He first served us. And we don't abide in God first. He first abided in us. Because oftentimes we run into Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13. And we come across this and he says, You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And we think it's up to us. Oh, I got to abide in Jesus. I have to seek him and I have to find him. I have to seek him with all my heart. 
We know Jeremiah 29, 13, but how many of us know Jeremiah 24, 7? What is Jeremiah 24, 7? I, God, talking first person here, I will give them my heart to know that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return to me with their whole heart. God will give you a heart to thirst and hunger after him. The reason you and I at all have this inkling, have this appetite, have this desire for God is because God called us, predestined us, foreknew us, justifies us, will you glorify us. God started it first. God created us and has given us a heart first. Where do you think that desire comes from? Is it from you? Is it you, oh, I need to try harder. Oh, I need to seek after God. It's like, no, God gave a heart, gave you a heart to seek after him. That's why the goal of the Christian life is uh, to live a lifelong intimate relationship with Jesus. My goal here on earth is not to go to heaven is because I know I'm going to go to heaven. My goal here is to bring experience heaven on earth by being in close relationship with Jesus, by abiding in Jesus. So I have uh, two observations uh, that I want to talk to us about. The first is this, that fruitfulness is the result of the life of Jesus being pr- reproduced in you. Let me say that again. Fruitfulness is the result of the life of Jesus being reproduced in you. In other words, we're not fruitful apart from Jesus. The only reason there's any semblance of good within us, the only reason that we experience any sort of success or any sense of fruitfulness in our, in our lives is because it's the life of Jesus being reproduced in me. See, the main point of Jesus' metaphor here is that God wants us to increasingly bear fruit in our lives. He wants us, remember Jesus says, John chapter 10, I have come to give life and life to the full, a life of fruitfulness, a life of abundance. Look at our text in John chapter 1. Or verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that what? Bears fruit, he prunes, that it will what? Bear more fruit. And by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Let me ask you something. What happens when we bear much fruit? What does it say in verse 8? When there's fruit in our lives, God the Father is glorified. When there's fruit in our lives, Jesus is made famous. The Father looks good. The Father is glorified. We make the gospel attractive. What else happens when we bear fruit? We prove to be genuine disciples of Jesus. We're genuine disciples of Jesus, not because we said the sinner's prayer or we have a he is greater than I sticker or because of any of those things. There's fruit in our lives. When there's fruit in our lives, it validates that we are genuine Christ followers. And you might be asking, John, what is fruit? Well, fruit is is evidence of life change, evidence of transformation. There's a, the frequency of sin is less in your life. Your desires have changed. Your appetites have been altered. Your priorities have shifted. There is a paradigm shift in your worldview. The things that you wanted to do, you don't do anymore. The things you didn't want to do anymore, those are the things you do in a good way. What is fruit in your life? I think 
The litmus test is that in your time, in your talent, in your treasure, that you want to draw closer to Jesus, that there's change. The cycle of sin in your life has been broken. It's because of Jesus. And any sort of fruitfulness, it's not because of your obedience. It's not because of your good works. It's not because of you're a good person, you're a kind person. Any sense of fruit, it's because you and I are connected through Jesus. It's, it's all because of Jesus. It has always been about Jesus and it will always be about Jesus. He is the true vine. It's because of the gospel. And lastly, we'll close with this, that pruning is the reward of abiding in Jesus. Remember we talked about that fruitfulness is the result when there's fruit in your life, when there's change. It's because the life of Jesus is, being the, is produced in you. That is the result. But pruning is the reward of abiding in Jesus. Uh, here's a brief video by one of my uh, just heroes in the faith. Uh, his book, uh, The Cross of Christ, uh, by J.R.W. Stott. He's an English a scholar and a pastor. But uh, let me just show briefly this video. It's about a minute long of the, the fruit and the pruning process that God allows us to do so that He could bear more fruit in our lives. Let's take a look. God the Father is pictured as a gardener. He is anxious that the fruitful branch will become more fruitful, so he prunes it for its own sake. And to the uninitiated, it looks exceedingly cruel. Sometimes only a stump is left, jagged and scarred, to face the storms and the cold of winter. But when the spring or the summer arrive, there is much fruit. The sharp pruning knife has after all brought a blessing. With such a vine dresser to prune us, and with such a vine to abide in, God has made every possible provision for our fruitfulness. He has a right to expect us to become increasingly fruitful that is increasingly like Jesus. If you've been walking with Jesus for a while now, pruning does not feel like a reward. Pruning, cutting, God cutting things in your life. It feels like punishment. It feels like death. It feels like judgment. But Romans uh, 12 says that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I may, I'm going to challenge you to have your mind renewed in this area, in this area of pruning. Pruning is the reward of abiding in Jesus. When you walk with God, when you are walk, when you live your life in the Spirit, when you live a life of obedience to God, and you abide in Him, you find your home in Him, guess what? He is going to prune areas in your life. But the good news is that this is the reward of abiding in Jesus. You know, for the first two years of my marriage and uh, being in vocational ministry, the first two years, Renee and I moved six times. We couldn't afford to live out on our own. We stayed with my parents. We stayed with her parents. We stayed with my parents again and back to her parents. You know, we, before we moved out here to Hawaii, like we didn't place, we didn't stay at a place more than seven months on our own. That we always lived with in-laws because times and finances were tough. 
And the Lord um, pruned where the Lord closed the door for us to do ministry in L.A., in Los Angeles. And we're like, how are we going to survive? Well, almost 13 years later, we've lived out on our own. You know, a husband, a man should leave his, his father and mother and cleave to his wife. We've gone through so much pruning in our lives. Uh, even during this sabbatical, um, you know, one of, in the beginning of the year, one of our closest friends, our best friends since we moved here to, the, to Hawaii, uh, the Perezes, they left. You know, he was my right-hand man in ministry. He was part of the council, Damon, and they left. I'm like, oh, Lord, what are you doing? And I was like, Lord, is your hand still upon us? I remember the end of last year where the house that we stayed at for almost 10 years, the property owner, they said, oh, you guys got to move out. And we've always looked at the place that we lived at like God's hand, like, hey, I got you. You're... My favor is upon you. I've called you here because I've provided the place. And then after that, the Lord took away the place. I'm like, Lord, do you still have us here? Even during, the pan uh, during our sabbatical, um, our close family friends, neighbors of ours, uh, Judah and Noah's close friends, the Frenches, they moved to South Carolina. And... People moved, people have come and left. And even the church right now, we're about like, you know, like less than 40% are back. And the Lord has done a lot of pruning. And it, listen, your pruning right now, it could be a relationship. It could be um, a sense of security. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it's your health. The Lord pruned it. But listen, when God prunes you, it's so that more fruit can grow. You know, people ask me, have asked me, hey, what did the Lord minister to you during your Sabbath, your sabbatical? And what the Lord has given me is that, yes, Lord, I'm going to renew my passion. I'm going to renew. I want to serve you with a pure heart. You know, it's almost like a renewal of vows when married couples, they have a renewal of vows after 25 years or 30 years or 50 years, they renew their vows. And what I love about renewal of vows is like knowing what I know now, I say yes again. And through all the pruning that God has done in our lives, in my life, and all the pruning that God is doing in your life, Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a financial setback. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job that you don't get. Maybe it was an opportunity that you think you missed out on, you missed out on. The Lord prunes and He does so, so that we could be dependent wholly on Him and that more fruit would grow. Because here I have here a jabong tree, like if there's many branches, all of our energy and all the nutrients will go to different places. But God prunes so that we only have a few and God wants to bear fruit in your life. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. And as uh, before we pray, we're going to take uh, communion. And communion, it's a a supper, it's an intimacy. It's this close union that Jesus had with his disciples for you and me. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to fellowship with you. That through his death, through his blood that was shed, he paid for the penalty of our sins. Though his body was broken so that we don't have to live in brokenness, that we could actually live in wholeness, abundant, fruitful life. And so I'm going to pray for us uh, today and um, and as I pray would you just acknowledge maybe it's time for you to grieve through some pruning seasons in your life pruning areas that God is doing 
All right, and then we're going to take the uh, communion. We're going to partake of the Lord's cup. Okay, so let me go ahead and pray. Father, I just uh, pray right now. Your word says that um, we are to examine ourselves. So Lord, I just pray right now that if there's any doubt of your goodness, Lord, sometimes we, the pruning, it feels like a punishment. But Lord, you're pruning areas in our lives so that more fruit will grow. So Lord, we don't doubt your goodness. We don't doubt your faithfulness. But Lord, we thank you that you abided in us first. And this morning we abide in you. And so Lord, as we eat of this bread, would you give us strength? Would you give us sustenance, oh Lord God, to stay close to you, that we would practice the presence of God? Lord, I pray as we uh, drink of the cup, Lord, we would be sustained by your grace. Lord, I pray that we would draw near to you today. We thank you for the cross. Thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and said, this bread has been broken for you. Eat of this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and eat of the bread. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Drink of this as often as you eat, for as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's go ahead and drink of the cup. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you so much for joining us, you guys. It's so good to be back home. I miss you guys. If you're able to join us at 10 a.m. at Antioch and Kahala Mall, we would love to fellowship with you, give you guys a hug, give you guys a fist bump, a high five up here. And if you volunteered, if you've served with us, uh, please make sure to join us for our uh, servant appreciation dinner. We love you guys. Have an amazing week. Take care.